Thanks for coming back after lunch. Uh, this is going to be an incredibly dynamic, uh, wide awake presentation full of excitement and, and laughter. Uh, as you'll learn in this next session, our speaker is skilled across nearly all aspects of our industry. She's designed, built and managed many performative sites in the public and private sectors. This makes me consider whether user experience specialists are really generalists in everything else. Let's find out. Please put your hands together for Claire Moava Sherrington. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Did everybody have a good lunch? Yeah, we're going to stay awake for a whole hour. We all right? Okay. So my session today is an intro talk about UX. It's not focused particularly on Drupal but it's focused on actually getting you to understand what UX is, why we do it, and hopefully some tips and tricks and tools to actually get you started with some UX. Does that sound good? Is that what we want? Excellent, you are in the right place. So to get us there today, we're going to explain what it is. I'm gonna give you an example of a UX problem, just to resonate um, actually what it is. We're going to have a look at the different steps in UX, because it's just not one activity, it's many parts and many activities. Also, I think it's really important to say that there is challenges with UX. So who am I? Who's this funny lady standing up here in front of all of you with a Kiwi accent? Well, I've been in this industry 12 years now, over 12 years. I've kind of bounced around a bit. I formally trained as a developer in, in C in the 90s, and I also did graphic design and found that quite boring. Then natural progression, project management, and then also into analysis, and kind of dabbled a little bit in data and data mining. I was really lucky to be able to work in the private sector and the public sector to really understand different users and different needs. Also, I think that helps me in this role is I've actually worked as you know in customer service. I stood behind a counter for every Saturday and Sunday in my you know when I was doing my uni degree. So I understand what people want around customer service. Also. I really love academia. I've got a degree in computer science and I've just finished a master's. So I'm really interested in research and why we do these things and actually how other people have found research improving you know, their theories. So that's me in a nutshell. Also, in my spare time, I am a dead keen mountain biker can see on the left there, there's my mountain bike kind of perched on a nice cliff face, and my two beautiful cats, Queen Tash and Stumpy. Key, key supporters in my career, those two cats. Now let's get on to something more serious. Now user experience and its design. Now what is it? I know we all banter this term around, UX. God, you know, is it just another fad? Is it just something else? Well, really, simply, it's how we feel about something. You know when you go to a user website or go to a shop and you have that, oh, stink, oh, man, that was really awesome. That is the nutshell of UX. So a really simple diagram, you know, you kind of, oh, this is terrible, oh, and then you have an experience and you feel happy about it. That's the feeling about user experience. That is the feeling of about a product, system, or service. Now, I know that's kind of a bit holistic and high level, so we just take that down to technology level. And it's simply a person's experience with a system, may it be a website, may it be a bit of software. It's every aspect of that bit of software, though. It's the interface, it's the visual graphics, the colors could be a cultural, using the wrong colours and it makes somebody feel not so happy about what they're doing. 
actual physical interaction, are you making the click on a button here and, there's, and the next button's over here and then you're giving them bad instructions or you might have designed a system for a desktop and you're making them use it on a mobile phone. It's just not the same. Also I wanted to just, so we've got this idea of, you know, it's about how a person feels about interacting with a product or a system. I think it's also important <coughs> to point out that this is actually just a little bit of a bigger problem. Originally when I started out uh, in the 90s, I did quite a lot of work academically in human interaction. And this diagram up here kind of gives you the wider circle about human interaction beyond technology. So if you look at the bottom half of that circle, our focus is digital. And so you can see there that's like customer service and waiting online. Some of the examples we've already talked about. But gaze your eyes up to the middle and up to the top there. I think we can all resonate with the fact that you've rung up somebody on the phone, you know, maybe a tax department or, you know, maybe a travel company, and you might not have a good experience because you're you know, pushing, please push one for this. Please speak what your problem's about. So it's not quite digital, but it's still about the experience. So my favourite is door handles, actually, right at the top there. I've had, you know, the, is it push or is it pull? So that circle there, you know, what we're dealing with is a, part, a little bit. There's just a, there's a wider world out there too. So it's also, I think it's important just to remember that when you're dealing with your little UX problem, that actually the world around us has got many usable, there's many, many problems out there. Now, building on the fact that it's about feelings and building on the fact that it's a big world out there, there are many parts to UX that you kind of need to know about. So even up here, I was building the slide and actually had other ones I wanted to put on there, like customer service, actually knowing how to deal with people. I think that's really important. But you just look up here, library science, information architecture. What I'm meaning there is how we put the information together. That's a big part of UX. If we go to, if we've got any marketers um, in the room, market research and analytics, that's really important. What uses previously done on a website, you know, what, what's their behaviours, can we track that? And if we've got any communications project managers, directors, we all know that communications is really important because we need to communicate this to clients and then end users and then the person has to pay the bills. So there's a lot of aspects to UX that you kind of need to just have a handle on. Just I think for my background, I'm very lucky because I've been able to work in some of these areas. But it's something you can always build on and read on and ask Google. So I want to move on that we know what it is now. We know that there's many components to UX. But why should we do it? One of the biggest things I've found in the last couple of years is actually selling UX to a product owner, a project manager, a client, even sometimes other members in your team. Why do you want to do that UX stuff? It's kind of like, yeah, we know what we're doing. God, I know how to build that. I, I buy books online. Oh. So this slide I've actually used quite a lot externally and internally to just say, hey guys, it's about customer loyalty. If you've got a happy customer, are they going to use your product and service again? Pretty much. And they might even tell their mum and their friend to do it. You know, hey, this is a really good site, really easy to use. I've done it. I've done it myself. And for more of the money-minded aspect of selling, return on investment, conversion rates. If they're happy with the site, they're going to come back and they're going to probably make their order bigger. It's an online site conversion rates, you have, you know, building up your client base. 
three, I think this is a two-way street, productivity and efficiency. So what I mean there is you've got an online site. You've got this Drupal site and people are maybe buying books on it and they don't need to use the feedback as much. So, you know, oh, I can't do this book transaction because the site is really hard to use. So they email you or they might ring you and say, oh, I can't manage to get X, Y, Z. I can't add shipping. If your site was easy to use and you understood about the user, you might see a drop in those calls. And also flip side for me, as a user, if you had the site that was easy to use, it saves me time. So I'm, I'm a busy person, I'm off mountain biking, and if the site's really quick and easy, yes, that's going to be the site I'm going to use. And finally, happy customers. Well, what can I say about happy customers? They keep coming back. Happy, happy team, that's what we want. We want to retain our clients. So I really recommend that that's actually worked really well, those four points really can help you get a little bit more UX in that project and then support its importance. Now, I want to change gear. I actually want to talk about a problem. You know, let's have a look at a classic UX problem. Now, Wellington, I'm from Wellington, it's the capital of New Zealand. We've got 400,000, it's a fantastic city. In summer we have events and we have music and we have wine festivals and it's, it's just absolutely stunning. It's all across the city, it's very diverse, but I have got a really busy calendar and I've got lots of friends. I want, my, I want to go to these events with my friends and I don't want to know where they're located. <coughs> but lucky me, Wellington City Council has put out a phone app to tell me where all the events are, what they're about, lucky me, excellent. I was so excited about two months ago when this came out, I could put it on my phone, my Android, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna know where to go and I can share with my friends, choice. So here's the phone app. Okay, it's called Summer City. We do have fine weather in Wellington. And, you know, kind of tells me the dates and you kind of scroll up and down like this. So, oh, that, that's quite cool, kind of date order. So that's kind of a bit of a plus, isn't it? And I can refresh it, that's kind of good. Oh, okay, oh, I like Lost Bird. Okay, I clicked on one of the, one of the offerings from the first screen. And it's telling me that this is the only, this is the screen I get, there's no location on, a, on there how long it's going to be. Oh, okay, that's kind of cool. It tells me about it. It's all right. I'm thinking about I might find out where the location is or I might share it with my friend or see how busy it's my calendar. I thought, oh, that button at the top, that kind of looks like the next step. So I kind of came up and went, oh, add to favourite. Okay, that's kind of cool. Come back later and compare to other events I like. Share by email. Mm, not bad share with my friends by email. Facebook, mm, not all my friends are on Facebook. Twitter, mm, maybe. And then messaging. I'm like, hmm, how do I know where the event is? How could I maybe save it into my calendar? You know, just to see if I've got anything else on. So it's kind of like, hmm, you know, mobile phone app, location. I didn't feel like I got the best user experience out of this application from the council. I was a bit disappointed. I had all these high hopes. I was like, this is a classic kind of example for UX. It's like, they didn't think about this is a mobile thing. You might want to actually use it on location and as you're walking around. And for me, this, this lovely machine is also my diary. <laughs> Let's just move on to more project stuff. Now that we understand what UX is and why we do it and we've got an example, I just want to move into making this quite a practical kind of session looking at different activities and hopefully 
you guys have got enough knowledge to give some stuff a go. And before we start that, I just want to, you know, it's all not rose-tinted glasses. It's actually a bit of a balancing act. Um, we'll have a look at some of the different activities, but I know everybody out there, we do have to balance things. You know, we've got user needs, we've got technical requirements, and we've got business constraints. So I know when you're in a project, you've got these kind of things batting around. So you need to fit an activity to the size and scale of your project and also to three, three aspects. So the moving parts of UX. This is quite a famous concept that was brought out in the early 2000s by a guy called Jesse Gar. Now, I really like this way of thinking about UX just because of a few things how it says abstract to concrete. So you kind of like got the woolly stuff this end, so left side's the woolly stuff, and the concrete st stuff is on the right hand side. Also, I like how it builds on itself. And this is really what UX is. All the different activities in UX build on the previous activity. So you kind of got a strategy where you want to go, a scope, how big is this monster? Then a structure, how are we going to attack it and how, what's our plan? Then a skeleton where we start building stuff out. And then a surface. What, what's it actually going to look like? I'm not going to cover all these areas, but I'm going to pick a couple that I think are going to be a good starter. And also to say that not every project actually does all these steps. It's all to, all to do with scale and size and time. And probably the only correction that I'm trying to find in the last two years is you see navigational design down in the skeleton. With the rise of things like responsive design and mobile computing, I do feel that needs to come a bit down the track a little bit this way, even move into structure. Because the way we design our navigation is nearly fundamental, or it's becoming more fundamental in how we do projects now. But this has stood the test of time. It's now what, 13 years old, so that's pretty a lifetime in IT. Also, another way to think about it is, because I've been in IT for a while now, and another way is to think in circles. So some project managers and some business owners and some clients might struggle with the idea of actually strategy, scope, scope structure, skeleton, surface, they might actually resonate more in these kind of groupings, like the old kind of, let's do some requirements and let's do some architecture. You might actually see these terms might work better, but covertly, you're actually kind of more going on the strategy, scope, structure, path. But this, that language might just help you start adding UX to your projects. Okay, let's have a look at our left-hand side. So this is all the fluffy stuff. But the fluffy stuff is important because we need to know what the client, what the, what the client really wants from a project. Now I've worked on a few projects now, and this gets missed out, and the project just blows up because we actually don't know what we're doing. So you've got all these like really energetic people running around trying to deliver a project, but you actually don't know what the purpose is, and then you waste a lot of money. Ian, you can make this quite a short exercise. So what we're trying to really do here is understand what this project's about. So step one, you really need to get the right people in the room and actually understand why they want to do this project, what's, the, what's success look like? That's usually my, one of my key questions to ask them. So what's this, if this is going to be the perfect project and you want the perfect product, give me a description and this will help you right throughout your project. Um, some of my techniques, is I meet with project stakeholders, maybe little mini meetings um, work quite well if you've got a big organisation. Face-to-face uh, -face is very important, you can't really do this one over the phone. And also if it's a government client, get their statement of intent. Get their, that's what we call it in New Zealand, but basically the plan what that agency is meant to be doing and delivering for the next three to five years. There will be the purpose in that document. 
also their business cases, they're usually quite good too. They should put those in there. So they are my kind of top tips for actually getting that down on paper. And usually it's like about five sentences, what they actually want to achieve. And make that known to your whole project group. One of the bigger areas is user needs. Now the next session after me, um, Chris is going to be focusing on that more, but I think it's important to start, it's such a big area to start thinking about it in the way I do it. Now the goal is very simple, and you need to understand the audience of what you're building for. You know, are they mothers? Are they construction workers? Are they somebody of a really busy social life and doesn't know where the locations are of those events that she wants to go to? And the only way you're going to do that is actually talk to your users. I know it's scary, it won't bite your head off, and it does sound like a lot of work, but you can make it easy on yourself. So the techniques I've used, and horses for courses, size of budget, you've got a lot of options here. And I've got a few tools that will really help too in the next couple of slides. Interviews, i.e. talking to your end user. Uh, focus groups, where you get a small number of people, maybe four, four to six or eight, and get them in a room for, say, an hour, ask them some questions about their experiences. That's quite nice. They bounce off each other, so it's good. Watching people use sites, that's a very easy one to do and user surveys. Now there's a few things that could help you get started here. And then actually with the user surveys, annual user surveys if you can, usually when I have a client and we do one, I try and encourage them to do it the following year. You know, they might have a, how you find the site. So some of the things I use, uh, user research, these three products here, do Doodle is a really nice online organizing tool where you can just get, herd those cats for your uh, user groups. So giving them a section of times, great tool. Skype, oh, I've used that several times. I mean, New Zealand is quite long and vast there, so at Wellington, Christchurch, Auckland. I've had some users down in Christchurch. So I've actually you know, got them on Skype and you know, did reviewing like that. The product to the right is a really interesting one. I just wanted to mention it, is when you transcribe, say, an interview or a user group, this here is an open source sort of software where you put your words in, basically, and it comes out with themes. So it's a really nice open source tool that I've used a lot in research now, and it's really delivered. It's a bit hard to get installed sometimes, but you know, persevere and you'll get a really good uh, set of results. But there are many, many, many tools. Like I, I haven't really settled on one good voice recording tool. So if you're an interviewer and you want to record, I've got one on my phone, I've got you know, my laptop. Um, so there's many out there I haven't really found one I liked. User surveys, well, hey, what can I say? Drupal. <laughs> I've used um, user surveys, Liz form module many, many times before, and I find it absolutely fantastic. Um, so setting up a survey on the site you might be replacing, or you know, community site, if that's the audience you're trying to target, if you're looking to actually have a look, you know, ask some questions about what you think of the site, or what you think of the process, and basically, you know, you could leave it there and rerun it the next year. So the client really likes stuff like this, it's like, oh, survey for this project, but then they can rerun it and benchmark it the following year. Again, there's other products out there, I thought I'd mention that one, because that's also one of them from the past, it's pretty good, uh, if you can't use the Drupal module. Okay, so we're just going to move along from scope a little bit, and we're going to look at um, the kind of requirements area. Now, I know requirements is kind of like, <sighs> it has to be done. I'm going to pick on content requirements and technical requirements. I'm going to pick on content requirements because I think it's quite overlooked, and it could be quite good for Drupal 8 too, because of all the improvements that I've just seen this morning from the keynote is content requirements is about those poor people that have to put the content in the, in the system, mainly focused around them. And I, why I want to focus on it is I find that's one of the sticking points of projects. You know, you get to a point where you're about 70, what, say 70% through a project and then there's this major problem with 
adding you know, a content type or something like that, or a bit of content or videos falling apart, or I've got to store these files and how's it going to work. So I, I have found that that's been quite a problem in the past. And the way of doing that sort of thing is actually, again, you want to talk to the people face to face, but this is starting to get quite complex. It might be about workflow. You might publish a bit of content and needs to review it, and then it needs to go live, and then it's got to have to be embargoed, and then it needs to be archived, and then it needs to go back to the draft. Think about doing diagrams. That's a really easy way to start. Even just get a piece of paper and start scribbling it down. Uh, there's many, many different bits of tools and techniques you can use but diagramming is a really good way to level the playing field. Like, techniques I've used, personally, is writing down the user requirement. Doesn't usually work too good with developers. They like the pictures. Uh, there's a technique called um, UML, which is Unified Modeling Language. That's a series of different diagrams. I've got a couple to show you. And then actually describing, getting drawing out those people that use the content, actually get them to describe what they do. So it's got a user case. And then developing stories, which if you're agile, agile background, you basically write a little summary of what they do and what they need. Right, we'll have a look at technical requirements, and then I'm going to show you some tools I've used to help me document. So the technical specifications, technical requirements, the kind of feature set is basically having a look at what group of features that you want on your site. A feature could be, I want to log in, I want to buy a book, I want to look up my house on a map, I want to add an event to my calendar. So that could be a feature. So that's actually looking and describing it enough to get the developer to kind of get bit of an idea, enough to get the designer to start thinking about it. That's sort of how long is a piece of string when you're writing the requirements up. We don't want to over, overdo documentation. So how do you do it? Well, again, workshops. You can see this iteration and importance of actually communication, workshops, talking to the end user. Also building on what you've just done. So that user research you just did and that business workshop you did, you're going to go back and have a look at that too. So if business owner said that that map was really important, you know, you're really going to have a look and how what the requirements are around that. And this is really important. You can see that coming through in Agile now too. Just you know, building up the needs, the priorities will show through. Let's have a look at some uh, examples. So that's that unified modeling language. So I know Sounds a little bit technical, but basically this diagram here, you've got a person on the left hand side and he's got an event. He does an event, the next event occurs, that's the second line, third line, fourth line. And between the different events, you can see the arrows going back. So for a programmer or trying to explain to your client what happens, a simple diagram like this, person A types a username in, username, message appears, a message saying that it's not, not the right password, you can see how you can easily explain in the diagram. I've got a few more too. <laughs> Dork photography. So again, this one here is about a customer and it's a telephone catalogue and it's the sorts of things a customer could do in the certain website. Telephone catalogue, check status, place order, full orders, establish credit. Another one, again, quite similar. Um, this website or this um, activity's got a shipper, a salesperson, a supervisor, and the salesperson can place a recurring order. So, kind of, you can build up and, and see from the diagram what one actor's going to do. And again, you don't need all the flash software. These three here, I've used these in the past. Inkscape is an open source graphic software, it's quite an all rounder. Quite enjoy using it. Microsoft Visio has been around for a really long time. Um, again, it's very good for doing UML. And then my favourite at the moment, because I seem to change around a little bit, is uh, MyFileSamic. It does 
this sort of diagramming and you can do wireframing. Um, you can easily get it online. You can buy packages. And also the thing I really enjoy about it is my client can log in and leave me comments. So if she wants to do it at three o'clock in the morning and review the wireframe, she can. And for all the project managers in the room, you know, where are you gonna put all these requirements? The other two project, project management tools I've been using probably in the last two years. Trello, nice lightweight product. Um, as you can see, I've taken a screenshot of one of our projects and it's kind of edgely. And then there's mine as a very big sort of piece of software. It takes a bit of time to get this done. Right, my favorite information architecture, um, probably one of the more famous activities of UX. Basically, we're trying to do is organize the information and present it back in a logical way. There are many, many techniques and outputs to this area. Um, this is quite a well developed. Um, so I've got a few here and I've got some really good tools that can support you in this. Analytics, again, going back to the website, seeing how somebody's used the website before. What are these searches? What's the top 10 searches of this website you're rebuilding? So if it's a book website, are they always going to find categories? Is there some popular categories? You might want to look at that and how you can present that better in your new site. Card sorting, again, you might have a whole lot of topics. You know, going back to the book example, you have a whole lot of categories, cars, animals, fruit, and then automobiles, bikes, and you might want to get all those pieces of, um, all those topics on pieces of paper and get people to start grouping them. It's a really interesting exercise. And then seeing what your competitors are doing, that's also another interesting way of seeing how other people organize information. Outputs, site map, evidently where all the information sits, and maybe a content model, how the bits of content relate to each other. There's some really nice tools. This one here, Optimal Sort. Um, on the left-hand side, there's those cards with the topics on it. And you can see you can actually drop and drag. So this one has a nice cutout. You just drop the cards in, and you can group them together. For us, as UX people, we get all the stats. So we know when a person's dragged everything, and we get all, and it's really easy to send out to groups of people. Like you can set this up, send it out, Say, so leave it three days, you might do it through Twitter, you might do it through the company's Facebook account, whatever, whatever, or through your user group that you've obviously already interviewed, and you'll get results in a couple of days. It's brilliant. And again, you might have a site map, you know, you've organised your content and you're arguing over it. This is a great tool, this is TreeJack. This basically takes your site map, you set up five questions, can you find the information about the bike, you send it out, and again, in a couple of days, you have results, and you get an idea if your site map's gonna work. Interaction design, we're well, getting there, folks. Basically, this is looking at how somebody uses an aspect or a feature of the site. For example, logging in. So you're gonna drill down and actually see how a person logs into the site. And this is an area that you really build on everything you've done before, your user research, why the business wants it. And again, it comes back to talking to those users. And again, I think one of my real secrets is get my mum to explain it. So it might be logging into something and say, mum, how would you do this? And you sit with her and it's gold. Or it might be the flatmate or it might be the neighbor. But it's just good to see how other people think about a problem. There's many, many outputs to this area. Again, this is quite a mature activity in UX. Flow diagrams, storyboarding. You've probably heard of wireframes that are quite commonly used, and again, your now. So let's just have a look at two products. This here, Pencil, it's an open source wireframing tool. And I'll show you what a wireframe is in a second. And again, Mel Balsamic. And I just put this area up at the bottom. This is fantastic. This is already half-built, pre-built bits of wireframes that you can just download and start using. So you can actually build a wireframe, which I'll show you right now, in a matter of about 10 minutes. It's, so 
this one here is one from a project I did about a year ago, and this is a pencil one, and basically you can see that you've got a mock-up of a, a screen, this is the video catalogue, and then I'm explaining what each of the parts of the screen does. So this one here, that, that mock-up to go, already has a whole bunch of elements, you know, search boxes, uh, already in there. So you could be designing away in a matter of minutes. This again, this is a balsamic one, just to show you the different styles. Now I put information and design in here because I think it's pretty important and it's quite overlooked. And what it means is, you know, when you get a website, it's just not quite working. You're not whether it's, you know, is it about how pretty it is or how the flow is. It actually might be about the information you're trying to show. We all love the tube map, you know, the Wellington, I mean Wellington, the London tube map of all its line, how simple it is. That's a key example, brilliant example actually, of information design. If you saw the original maps of the London tube map, you wouldn't be able to, you know, you wouldn't be able to read it. But they came along with, this is an information design problem. So I just wanted to point out that if you really come to log heads and it's just not working, get you a visual designer, get your UX designer, they say, hey guys, is this really more of an information design problem than actually anything else? Um, infographics, design guideline, that sort of area. Again, it's a whole topic in its own right. Right, we're getting right down the far end now, we're kind of like at the, at the skeleton end. Interface design, you're going, well, what's the difference between this and interaction design? This is actually bringing it all together. This is actually about getting into a prototype, getting all those different aspects together and making it cohesive. You know how you get some sites and there's one bit that's really, really cool, and then there's another bit that's totally different? You kind of go, oh, I'm using this bit, and it's really, really good, oh, excellent. And the flow's all a bit off. Usually that's the kind of face to me that I haven't quite done this area quite right, and I do find one of the and this is actually quite hard to get time and money in a project because it's near the end and, or, you know, this seems like a lot of money to do a prototype and, you know, you get that kind of pushback. I'd really think about prototyping. I've got a few ideas there. These two here, introducing IQ as a New Zealand company from Wellington called Boost and you can actually do screenshots and run people through things. It's a kind of a mock-up based idea. By Balsamic and use a, another product on top of it and actually do run-throughs of things with, with using wireframes, that's one way of doing it. And then there's also this product here. Again, a different way of thinking about it again, but if you still get feedback, so it's good in a couple of days overnight sort of thing. And chalk mark, so basically you can give the user a task, go in, if everybody wants to press that button, sign up, say to banana.com, and you can actually track the user's behaviour, really nice. Navigation design, again, I'm not quite sure if Jesse's got it right now with all this new technology, but this is actually looking at how everything fits together. So how many levels deep of navigation should a phone have? Should it even have navigation? Should it be a drop-down menu? Should it be just search? Those big questions. I think user testing is quite important in this aspect and again, mock-ups, so going back to chalk, Mark, going back to this sort of product that will help you solve this problem. Right, now, coming to the end, I haven't, haven't bored you to death, but we got you too excited. I've got to let you down easy. There are some challenges. I found with UX um, some challenges, but not to put you off, project methodology, team buy-in, and working in a multi-vendor environment. Project methodologies, everybody here, you know, you've heard of Agile, there's iteration, there's waterfall. They all attack UX in a different way. So for example, Agile is quite good for UX, but what I've found is that those project managers and business owners kind of get a bit confused. Why are we paying for UX at the back end of a project? So usually you kind of, at the start of the project, oh, this is a really good idea, yeah, UX. 
get to do it right through the project. But about 70%, 80% mark, they don't really want to pay for it anymore and it's like running over and they want to, you know, features. So I find that hard, really, really hard. And just where it fits in. Team buy-in. Again, you know, you've got your internal team. Some people might not really understand what UX is, so they're kind of like, ooh, what's this new dark art going on here? Ooh, I don't know about this. So I find that you do spend a bit of time educating even your internal team, going, hey, it's about the users and it's about this. So to help that, I'd actually do a little session at the start of a project if you are taking on that UX role. To really explain it, use a couple of these kind of slides, easy. And then finally, multi-vendor, kind of have a big project and you've got UX involved, you might have a digital design agency, you might have somebody special in search engine, search engine optimization, then you've got a developer. Everybody's got their own idea about it. It's really hard. And some other challenges, I've kind of brought this up already, responsive design. There's many different breakpoints in all these different size screens and different purposes. Mobile phones is about being on the go. A desktop is about doing lots of work. You know, you're writing an essay, you might be writing up your presentation. There's different needs and different user experiences. How do we document it? How do we fit it into a project cycle correctly? How do we support the developers to get all those different requirements and user experience documented? It's been very challenging. And just some other ones I just wanted to throw in there. Um, the technology around the Internet of Things and how that's progressing and how the user experience will be evolved from that. And basically what I mean by Internet of Things is, you know, my cup is going to talk to the, the beaker in the end and my fridge is going to talk to my shopping list on my phone. How is the user experience going to be evolved from such a different sorts of items relating to each other? Server design, that's more the end-to-end. -end. Um, bless us, we're IT. We might not control the very first contact a user has with a company. We kind of get sandwiched in the middle. So that's kind of hard. And then again, accessibility needs. We know it's all important, but it kind of just kind of gets shoved down here somewhere. And at some point, that's going to be more of a problem, I think, with laws changing, governments um, making it more of a mandate. So in conclusion, it's kind of like leaving a, a sad note, but in <coughs> conclusion, you're designing an experience. Remember, let's go back right to the beginning. It's about that feeling. You're trying to make that customer happy. Just remember that, happy customers. And there's many steps in the UX process. Now, don't beat yourself up if you don't do all of them, but I hope I've picked a few today that I, I feel are really essential, especially user needs and knowing where you're going, and just start and grab one of these tools and have a go, you know, and trying to get a few people at your work to buy in to UX too will really help start a little group at work or just with your um, other peers. And I really do want to say there are some challenges, but they can be overcome. You know, maybe five years ago, you know, there were other challenges. There were really little phones, <laughs> you know, that weren't smart. So. Over time, we have different challenges and we'll overcome them. Now, I have got some time for questions. How's my timekeeper? Good. Oh, good. Oh. Okay, has anybody got any questions or is everybody asleep? Very good question. Okay, the question is, what are the critical UX activities you should do? Does that sound about right? Okay. What I'll do, I'm just going to quickly go back to. Come on. Uh, slide. I think it's going to take. Ah, here. Right. For me, I think the key kind of activities are always do your most, your strategy, you need, you need a plan, you need 
to understand what the, the wider holistic direction of the project's going. That's a really small exercise. It doesn't need to be terribly elaborate. I've got about five questions at work that I, I kind of, even if I don't do it myself, like, project manager, you need to do this, and you document it. I think that's a critical, easy tick box exercise. I really love the idea of user, user research, but I know it's really hard, but do push for it, and it could be easy as getting a few customers in a room for an hour and bribe them with somebody's baking. That's a really, so you have to be a good baker. So I think that's the next one, and I think it's really important. I think one will really bite you in the bum if you don't do it. Sorry to be so crude, but interaction design. If you kind of just leave it over here and don't worry about it, you'll spend so much time in picking problems later and spending so much money to try and fix those problems that you kind of didn't look at originally. It's worthwhile having a look at it. Even if you really have to stick your heels in and say, project manager, business owner, can I have a couple of days just to look at this problem? And then information architecture, the old card sort, maybe use the, those programs. And interface design, probably, it is the next one. So overall, that's probably how I'd navigate that. Does that answer your question? Good question. Okay, the question is how to cost out UX to a customer. I think first thing as you do is get the buy-in from the customer before you give them the, um, the budget. <laughs> and I've actually been analysing past projects to have a look how much UX has been costing. And because I'm a little, I do a little bit of project management, so that this might be ballooning a bit high. But you could say about 15% of the total project you could cover in UX. So you might have you know, 100k budget, it's around 15%. Now that's a good question to ask because some projects require quite a lot of visual design and some don't. So if it's quite a basic one, yes, but I have been in situations where you know real glossy sites and you kind of have lots of that kind of, you could blow out to 20, you know, easy. It also depends what design you have too. Yeah, so with, actually that's a good question. We've been doing the last couple of projects agilely. So this is just, um, just for everybody else. It's uh, basically looking at how you break down the costing. That's about right, eh? Um, probably not to the detail of buttons and things. It's usually groups of activities. So the last project I just did, um, we went to the client and said, right, what, what activities would you like to do? And they went, I want some of that, some of that, some of that. Lots of user research, so I was really happy. It's great. And we costed out on the types of activities, and then that actually worked quite well. She was quite happy in the end, because she's like, oh, lots of research, looked really good for her boss. She got some really good results. Visual design was just lumped as a visual design cost. And really, because there was so much upfront work, the visual designers knew exactly what they were doing, and then actually the cost went down. Yeah. And it makes them quite happy, the visual designers. You know, they don't kind of stomp off. You've got, yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, the question is, in my projects, do I consider usability, no, accessibility, sorry, accessibility issues right through the project. Now for me, personally, I've got an uncle that's um, blind, and so personally, I try my best to always do, because I already know what his needs are, so that particular user case is quite close to my heart. Um, we have many government clients for, in Catalyst IT, so actually accessibility is quite important, and it's really nice to be able to do those requirements. Private clients, not so much. They're usually wanting to spend on other features. So I find it really hard. 
um, but there are some things you can really just do, you know, like around the content accessibility, adding tags to titles and using the right headings. And so there's tips and tricks you can just teach your clients that actually help with those demands of accessibility requirements. But it is nice working with government clients that say you have to do it. So yeah. Does that answer your question? Oh, I am off the hook. <laughs> and if you've got anything, other questions, please just come find me. I'm happy to chat. Okay, so we break uh, people break into two. So uh, we've got Mrs. Christy, who's going to be Karen, who's the director of Russian. Uh, I think it has some people in there. Mm. Uh, we'll do it for the for next four hours if you want. Yeah. Great, thanks very much, Claire. Thank you.